Okay, it's our last session of the conference. And so um, for this last session, we're talking about the GRI phenotype. And we have speakers who are presenting. Uh, first two speakers, Dr. Tim Banke and Dr. Jennifer Bain are going to talk about grin disorders. And then uh, Dr. Alan Bayat is going to talk about GRIA disorders. Um, so I wanna welcome our first speaker. Dr. Tim Banky, don't sit down. <laughs> uh, from um, Colorado Children's Hospital. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I guess this session is what's between you and heading out dinner. Um, so uh, thanks very much to the organizers for asking uh, us to present today. And so I think I'm a bit of an overview of things, and I apologize to those that are speaking after that if it's if there's some overlap um, as we go through this. So um, I'm going to talk about grief phenotypes and uh, just as in really terms of a general overview. So these are my disclosures, nothing that's really super relevant to what we're talking about. Um, these are my acknowledgments. I have uh, a lot of great people to work with. Um, the group at Emory uh, Steve as the lead there that's that's keeping us all uh, funded for doing this, but of course in the past we've had uh, funding from uh, Grin2B as well as uh, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy. Uh, this is my group uh, at University of Colorado um, and Children's Hospital Colorado, uh, Johannes's group in Leip Leipzig, uh, Jennifer at Columbia, the Cleveland group, and the, the UCSF group that's all part of Steve's grant. So uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just to say it very distinctly is agree uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, they're all unique and they're well-defined syndromes. And of course, as you know, that uh, GRI stands for glutamate receptor ion channel, and it's responsible for almost all excitatory neurotransmission in the, in the nervous system. There's four types, there's GRINs, there's GRIA, there's GRICs, and there's GRIDs. Each type contains four sometimes five unit, uh, five subunits. Uh, each subunit is a different gene on a different chromosome. There are uh, genetic alterations of any gene cause a different neurodevelopmental syndrome and gain or loss of functions. Our theory is, is that it causes a different sub syndrome within that. So there are likely then also to be spe specific therapies for each sub syndrome. And basically you end up with at least nine different uh, syndromes for each of the different disorders. And what's is emerging are these things called grid disorders. Uh, these are channels that don't necessarily form ion channels, but they're responsible for synaptic integrity. So um, grid disorders, they're common neurodevelopmental disorders. We know from Johannes's work um, with regards to uh, birth incidents that these are uh, pretty common when you think about how they compare to other common neurodevelopmental syndromes like Rett syndrome or Dravet syndrome. And, you know, their clinical trials have been underway. Um, but one of the big problems is, is that there are no specific ICD-10 codes um, for any of these disorders. So um, let me just make sure that you understand what, what that means is, is that basically if you see your physicians in this country, they will code you for what you're being seen for. Did you know that if you go into the emergency room because you were on a scooter, one of those crazy scooters that you can rent all over the place, you fall off and you hit your head, there's a specific ICD-10 code for that. <laughs> but there is none for, for us. I have a problem with that. Do you have a problem with that? So what that means is, is that we can't ask basic questions about what is the impact of any of these disorders because we don't have the tools there to do it. Um, there, there was a group of us that uh, recently um, went through the motions of jumping through small little hoops to see if, if we could get um, the CDC on the same page with us such that each of the syndromes could have their own specific ICD-10 code. Now you're gonna go in Europe, but we have ICD-11. Everybody has their own code here. And it's like, well, we wish that we would move towards ICD-11, but uh, uh, it's CMS, Center for Medicaid Services, does not want to move to ICD-11 just yet in this country. 
So anyway, there's a basic problem. We are doing what we can to try to get uh, specific codes um, because we think that this is gonna be important not only for understanding the impact of all of these disorders, it's gonna be part of identifying patients for trials and uh, when we want to get trials going for things like L-serine or radipradil or um, any of these other things that we, we think that we want to do in the very near future. So um, to go over again, uh, the functional analysis and what we think, why we think this is important. And we, we just heard some really great talks in one of the expert sessions about some of the, the mouse models and how they're coming along. But the underlying premise is this, is that the functional data will advance clinical opportunities. And as you um, may recall, it, what we're trying to do is functionally stratify everybody. So if you're simulating a uh, synaptic current in one of your expression systems where you, you've expressed one of the mutants is, is that what your wild type current will look like is the, the black line here, but in a loss of function change, it may look like this, or a gain of function, it may look like this. And for a gain of function, it could be bigger, um, as well as have this change in the time course. And for a loss of function, it could be smaller, as well as have a change in that time course. So it's a combination of those two features that can either push you over the edge to be gain or loss of function. But the question is, is that we're gonna talk about, where's that edge? So uh, when things are done in Steve's lab, there are eight uh, parameters that are assessed to determine the net effect of changes at, at synapse for uh, and for non-synaptic receptors. And as I said, there's the amplitude and then there's this time course. And basically the charge transfer, which is what we think is important is the amplitude times that time course. And as you all remember of all the cartoons that we've seen over and over today is, is that there's this part that spans the membrane of the protein. Then there's an important part where the uh, glutamate binds and this other part on the outside that senses what's going on in the, in the synaptic cleft, the N-terminal do domain. And then of course the pore through the membrane. And then there's a part that we really don't fully uh, uh, assess which is the C-terminal domain, uh, but it is going to clearly influence things like surface expression um, as well as regulation of the channel. And of course, all of these things we think are gonna influence things like uh, cl clinical stratification, such as all of the features that are associated with your grin disorder. And one of the things that has been really important to us is to have harmonized data collection throughout the world, partnership with parent groups and do this in longitudinal study. And this has been uh, really fun to uh, put this all together with, with Johannes um, uh, Lemke in Leipzig and uh, Jennifer at Columbia and Simons. So this is that um, classification of, of where we're trying to go is that um, where is that gray line where you go from gain of function to loss of function and how, how sure are we where we're, you're gonna, we're gonna put you. And so Steve has put together um, a nice uh, initial stab at where we think this should be in terms of how we eventually ascribe to you your gain or loss of function. And so there are different categories. There's likely loss of function, possible loss of function, likely gain of function, possible loss of function. So this is that gray area, but it is all meant to be associated with specific changes in those aspects of that are assessed um, in terms of those, those different features. And basically, you, you end up with a summary where you're either likely loss or gain, possible loss or gain, no detectable effect. Things can be also, uh, often uncertain or complex. And then there is this likely loss of function with the star, which basically means that um, in the expression systems, it's so hard to get the channels to express themselves that we think that it's probably a loss of function. So it's important, again, you know, I feel like uh, I'm a broken record as I, as I tell everybody over and over again, we really want you to join the registries if you haven't already, because um, this is how we're going to try to put this all together in the end. And there is a one-stop shop, which is through the GRIN portal. Um, but basically for Dr. Lemka's group, if you're in Europe, Asia, Africa, or other, or if you're North South America or Australia, um, this is where you'll go for this. And again, um, if you remember that, that generally gets you where you need to be. So this is what the portal looks like. This is how it directs you where you should go. 
And so uh, what do we know so far? Now there's been some nice, um, uh, several nice papers where um, Dr. Lemke's group has, has uh, put things together and there was a recent review uh, that we went through the different syndromes, but basically to be very, very um, general, and this is what we put together to describe and make our case to the CDC is that each syndrome was unique and needed its own code was we said that um, these, are the these are things that vary by the syndrome, developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism, speech issues, um, gross motor, fine motor, uh, seizures or not, or dystonia or not, um, storms or not, but there are specifics to each syndrome. Uh, GRIN1, uh, the symptoms are present in, in infancy with severe developmental delays in epilepsy. We know this is, you know, again, it was a general generalization. This isn't true for everybody. Grin 2B, present in infancy with variable, less severe developmental delays, less frequent epilepsy, sometimes brain malformations. Grin 2A, present with distinct forms of epilepsy and language disorders of childhood. And finally, Grin 2D, pres present with medically refractory epilepsy in the newborn period, uh, less than a month. And I put this in, in italics because I think Jen's going to talk to you more about Grin 2Bs. Uh, grid disorders, um, for a long time, these were thought to be generally autosomal recessive disorders. That is, uh, you have both alleles that are affected, um, and these were nonsense ho uh, whole and partial gene deletions. And there was a specific syndrome associated with that. It was called uh, spinocerebellar ataxia type 18. And these were the features associated with that. But now it's been seen that there are so uh, missense variants that are caused uh, a gain of function within uh, just one of the grid alleles. And these are emergent feed, emerging phenotypes. Grid one, um, really there's more to be done here, but for grid two, there is a phenotype associated with ataxia, cerebellar atrophy and developmental delay. And uh, there's a, a paper in process uh, from Steve's group to look at that more. So where are we in terms of um, uh, collecting things at the University of Colorado? So just to give you uh, where we are is, is that um, we've got uh, 52 GRIN1s, 42 GRIN2As, 75 GRIN2Bs, seven GRIN2Ds, three GRIN3Bs, one GRID, two GRIAs, one GRIA2, three GRIA3s, and no GRICs yet. Um, this is how they kind of break down in terms of the missense and nonsense. We've got a, um, a handful of deletions or duplications. And these are the ones that have functional analysis. Now, of course, um, there are a lot more functional analyses that are done on patients. Um, Steve, you were saying it's like 650, um, but these are just the ones that overlap with, with our group. And uh, thank you. Uh, we now have 17 follow-up questionnaires returned. So that's, that's good. Thank you for answering those emails and turning the follow-up questionnaires. Um, and I went ahead and I, I've swapped my slides around just to, because Liz asked the other day, um, but basically if, if, if we summarize uh, everybody, uh, basically here, um, Johannes's group is 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 kicking us with how how well he's doing with his awesome recruitment there. But um, these are our totals, and this is important because now that we have uh, these sorts of numbers here, we think that we have enough to start making these sorts of comparisons about if you have this group with these symptoms and this group with those symptoms, and these are you know, on the spectrum of gain and loss of function, we can start to make some sort of sense of all of this. So uh, we've, we've, we've beat the goal of, we wanted to have at least 50 uh, in each of these groups. And so we think we're, we're there really to do this for the GRIN ones and two Bs. Um, uh, there's already been some, some work with GRIN two A's. And so we're gonna look at that and see if there's anything else we can add to that. And we're gonna carry on doing our smaller studies for the GRIAs, GRIDs, uh, and GRIN 2Ds. And in terms of what our database looks like, um, we've got basically what we do is we, everybody, you all enter the information, but we have to do some data cleaning to make sure that it's all the records are complete. And there's a, a physician assessment by myself and Dr. Park for each of the records. And we, we kind of summarize in terms of what's going on with everybody there. And then of course, we want to combine all of this um, with our partners and turn it into a um, big papers that suddenly make everything clear to everybody. It, this, we, we hope that it works out that way. So thank you um, for listening. Thanks uh, for 
to all you families who've filled in the registry questionnaires. We really appreciate um, your time and effort. We, we recognize there is a definitive diagnosis. It's called form fatigue. And, but we appreciate you do you filling out the forms. And certainly thanks very much to our funders, uh, Cure, Grin 2B, Simons, and the Children's Hospital Colorado Foundation. So I'll take your questions. Clear as mud, excellent. Yeah, thanks, very nice. Um, I just wondered the 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 the, number, the prevalence of patients that you showed based on the 2020 data, presumably. Is is there a plan to update that based on 2023? Because the numbers that you had in your list didn't seem to quite match with the expected the prevalence from that 2020 study. Is there a is there an updated list? Or I'm going to make Johannes answer that question, please, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi. Um, so the the uh, the numbers of the prevalence is are estimates. Uh, there was a publication from Dennis Lau who um, uh, um, calculated the estimates of, of potential prevalences for all, all human disorders, actually. And um, I wrote a commentary on this, uh, I was invited to write a commentary on this article, and I used this algorithm from Dennis to calculate this exactly what would it look like for green one to A to B and so on. So this is hypothetical uh, prevalences. That's not real life world data. So, yeah. As Jen was mum, uh, murmuring, um, if we had ICD-10, it would be so much easier to, to do this. All right, thank you. Oh, no, one more. Go. Well, just, just on that issue, I mean, is that something as a layman that we should be writing to our senator about? I mean, I don't know what the political um, situation is or how that works at all. You said you've been petitioning for it to the CDC. Well, is um, that something that we need to deal so, with and think about? Um, you know, this is one of the reasons why you have Cure Grin and Grin 2B is, is that um, this is, you know, something that, that, that Keith and Cure Green has been working on to I mean, we've worked with Combined Brain as part of our petition. That's, you know, Keith pulled me in to do the presentation for this, but along with a number of other disorders, when we recently um, had this phone call with, with people from the CDC to do this. So, we're, you know, I, I think that's a good question. Do we need to have this huge, massive um, pile of signed papers that show up on um, this person at the CDC's doorstep? I, I don't know, but we're trying to figure out what's the best way to move them forward. We're, we are having a barrier with the people that we think that should be supporting us in this regard. For some goofy reason, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Neurology, the Child Neurology Society feel that clicking on something and pulling in a drop, drop down list is too much work for a physician. I mean, I'm overburdened. I've got a lot of work to do, wham, 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 but it's okay I think for all of us as physicians to do this and code people correctly, it's just the right thing to do. Um, but we're getting some pushback, unfortunately, from, from our parent organizations. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add on to that with, with the conversations about the ICD-10. I think it really is important to keep shouting about it, the people who uh, decided it's, it's just a group of individuals at the CDC and um, what they felt is that where there's not clear um, kind of like actionable uh, treatment plans for these diseases, what does it matter? So, um, you know, I think that we need to make the argument about why it, it matters and make that really clear. Yeah, that was part of the discussion that we had on the on the this presentation over a couple of days with them is to tell them why it mattered um, and such that they would realize, you know, it, it, it is important. Um, and the arguments that I made to them on the phone, because I was getting pushback from somebody at the American Academy of Pediatrics, who is an emergency room physician. So I put it into his language. I said, you have a patient that comes into the emergency room, they have a GRI disorder, and you want to give them ketamine for the procedure that you're about to do. That is a common thing that they would do. And I, I tried my best to put it in, in something that he could understand. And, you know, anyway, we're, we're still where we're at.
Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Benke. Um, so the one thing I'll just add to answer that question is um, there's a number of, of us groups, a lot of us through Combined Brain, but also some um, neuro, neurolog some, some associations uh, representing neurological diseases that are working together. And it seems that so um, it seems that what what we've heard from the CDC and and um, is that they don't necessarily they're not necessarily in the habit of counting individual letters, but what they want, what, what would influence them are the two associations that Dr. Benke mentioned, um, the, the um, group of um, neurologists and pediatricians. And so we may actually be doing together, we may be doing something where we're asking families to reach out to their neurologists and pediatricians to put pressure on the associations. So um, we presented about two weeks ago, we have two months of consultation. So we've got about uh, we've got about six weeks left to make a difference. So we may be reaching out very soon about that. So I encourage you guys all to help. Once I'm up here, I'm good. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bain. I'm a child neurologist. On behalf of all child neurologists, please don't email us. Email the board of email AAN and, and American Academy of Pediatrics. But um, I've definitely understood the, the uh, strength of ICD. Um, so I am a child neurologist at Columbia University. I take care of kids with neurodevelopmental disorders and a lot of genetic um, concerns as well. Um, I'm very animated. I like to pace. I'm not pacing. Yes, it was skiing. Yes, I had surgery a week ago. And I'm so glad that I'm here. Um, I have to say, for those who were in Dr. Trinellis' lecture just before this, um, he showed a picture from the 2019 group. And I've really had the, you know, amazing amazing ability to, to be with this group in eight, I think 18 and 19 and now 22 in person. Um, and I think what's one of the great things about being where I've been is that I also have been working um, in collaborations with Simon Searchlight. So I'm going to be presenting some data that's from Simon Searchlight, um, but this is actually your data. So when you met all those wonderful people outside um, from Simon Searchlight in the corner, and they will be here after this for those who have not, um, and they are available, I'll give you their information. This is the information that you've shared back. Um, and the really key thing is that harmonization really has been occurring. So since we did sit down in the lobby in 2019 um, in Atlanta, we actually did sit down and say, we don't want people to have to do 8 million forms. How can we align so that we're actually gathering the same data? And it's actually happening, guys. So it's very exciting. I didn't ask how to use this. Yeah, OK. So I'm gonna put on, I'm gonna take off my Columbia neurology hat and I'm gonna put on my Simon Searchlight hat. Um, and I'm gonna present uh, a little bit more in detail kind of about what the goals are. Where does this go? There, Simon Searchlight. Um, so Simon Searchlight um, is an international research program. And the goal of it is to accelerate science and improve the lives of families affected by rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. It's a great big team up here. The PI is Wendy Chung up in the top, and many of the members that um, have been here this week um, are, are seen here. Um, what are the goals of Simon Search? Like, well, the mission really has been to shed light on neurogenetic disorders. Um, it's not autism only, it's actually neurogenetic. So it's genetics first. Um, and the goal is really to collect high quality data natural history, meaning longitudinally, and then really be able to foster those relationships between the researchers and industries and families. What they do for those who have not been introduced to Simon Searchlight is collect detailed medical information, behavioral histories from validated measures that maybe you've actually um, encountered at school and psychologists. Um, they also collect and facilitate biospecimen collection. Um, I take all that information, we put it all together. We have some amazing team members that put it back and then guess what, we share it back. And so that's what we're gonna do today. And I'm really thrilled because when I first presented to the grin 2 b group, um, we didn't have the numbers we have today. And, and I really hope that I can keep coming back here and the numbers that we're seeing grow from grin 2 b will start kind of happening with, with your other groups as well. Um, the data is freely shareable with, with qualified researchers um, and the samples as well. And so the goal really is to connect these research participants and the researchers and get us all in the same room so we can talk about paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity and the models that we have available in your toolkit that you guys um, are contributing to. And obviously the goal of this is really to promote better understanding of all these genetic changes. 
So Simons Foundation is kind of the overarching. Safari is the Simons Foundation First Autism Research Initiative. There are different parts, different projects, but they're kind of all related in a continuum. So on the left, you can see we have a project that's the newest, it's called um, Spark. This comes from the diagnosis first. If you have a diagnosis of autism, you can participate and have genetic testing from that perspective. If they find a genetic reason that's contributing to your autism risk, then you get funneled into Simon Searchlight. Um, this is a genes first approach. So you don't have to have an autism diagnosis. We're talking about neurodevelopmental phenotypes, intellectual disability, global developmental delay, epilepsy, et cetera. And so these are individuals who have a genetic diagnosis first, and we're trying to go back and figure out how does the phenotype kind of match up. Again, as I mentioned, we'll collect behavioral intervention behavioral information over time, clinical data, blood specimens, and we can provide more tools to the toolkit to study this. And the more recent push has really been, as we've talked about, how can we think about the future, um, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, thinking about when we do lose fa our family members and we do still want to contribute to the field, um, the autism brain that really is something we are asking families to, to think about. It's, it's a hard decision um, to obviously go through and have that discussion, but certainly talking about it before, I think, um, can be helpful to hopefully Hopefully, um, opening up a, a lot more information to the brain. Um, we do, uh, from Simons Foundation, offer funding for outside researchers. As you've heard, many of the people here have had funding from Simons Foundation. Um, and as mentioned, they really are trying to build that resource, that data bank, so that we can share the animal models, share the share, use the Safari gene and the Safari base, um, and really um, try to foster that research community. Big green button. Um, as mentioned, Autism Brain Net, this is the program of Safari to really build upon postmortem brain tissue. Um, and donor families are, are, are really um, discussed and talked through these discussions because these are very obviously difficult discussion and we have more information about that if you're interested. So let's get down to the data. Again, this is uh, between hearing about this and dinner. So um, so we're going to go with Grin2B first because this is where the, the majority of the data that, that we have so far. So as of March 8th, um, what we're going to do is you're going to start on the left here. Step one is you sign up online. Isn't that easy? So you don't even have to go anywhere, which is one of the great strengths of Simon Searchlight. You provide your genetic lab report. We want to make sure that people who are um, participating really actually do have the genetic disorder. It will be reviewed by um, your genetic counselor team. Um, and then you share your important medical information. Um, surveys are provided um, in, in, initially and then as longitudinally as well. You have the opportunity, if you so please, to provide a blood sample if you're interested. And we'll talk about some of the people who have done that. And then really, again, what happens when our kid grows up? Well, that's the point of doing something like this. We really want to know and have that information as people are getting older. Um, Simon Searchlight's now 11 years, I believe. Are we at 11? 11? Yeah, 11 years. So, you know, we're getting a lot of data longitudinally, which is really helpful. And so if we look at Grin 2B, clap. Grin 2B, awesome job. This is really amazing, right? So when I first came here, these were like, just in the double digits. So 137 have signed up, 105 have, have confirmed their genetic reports, 84 have shared their medical history, standardized medical histories, 95 have, have filled out surveys, we have 30 who have provided samples. So this is really, this is really great. This is a lot of strength in numbers. And I think the goal is to take this and combine it with all these other great registries and, and really kind of not double up on the work you have to do, but really kind of gain some information that we can contribute to the field as a whole. So here's where we are with the others, okay? So GRIN 1A is the top here. So we have 15 individuals, GRIN 2A, we have 18 individuals and 2D is three. And I think the, the GRICs were, we got to work on, all right? So um, keep doing it. I'm telling you, if I come back in a couple of years, I want all those numbers all up in the hundreds, okay? We need to show the numbers. And this is probably going to give us more information since we don't have ICD-9 and 10 and 11 coding. What do we collect? Um, well, at minimum, we're really aiming, we, we, need a, we need a lab result to say what you have. Um, and then we really need um, medical history kind of information about your clinical picture or your clinical phenotype. Um, and then we do take information such as medications. And then there's a whole slew of other online surveys that we're really trying to kind of, um, we allow everybody the opportunity to participate in them as much or as little as you're able to. Um, and then specific kind of questions or questionnaires could be pushed out depending on, on um, what the community and researchers might be interested in. 
Um, coming in 2023, there are some newer assessments that will be coming out, such as the ORCA, which is a communication measure that's more commonly being um, researched right now, behavior problems, more developmental milestones, using different standardized scales, such as the PDCAT or um, Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory. Um, and there's been a really great interest in, in collecting all the EEG raw data. Um, and so, you know, I think you can think about all these great things that you can contribute. You've already had these things done and how can we contribute that back? So this is what a participant dashboard looks like. And so it, it's pretty simple. It shows a check mark when you did something. So um, you get registered, you consent. Everybody in the family can consent if they want to participate. We're not enrolling just the child. We're enrolling the family or whoever is interested and available. Um, and it kind of goes through exactly what you need to do. Um, there's a list of tasks that we can offer for you in your spare time. Um, and then there's some great things like Amazon gift cards after you come complete some of your surveys and, and rewards. And so the goal really is to kind of give back and, and thank you and appreciate you. Um, but again, you're, you're giving back to yourself and your, your research community. Um, and so you really, hopefully, and, and we take feedback. Um, so if you say this doesn't work or this doesn't look great on my platform, um, let us know. Um, and so what are some of the biospecimens we have now? Well, there are 29 participants who have participated in the biospecimen collection. And so there are currently 12 um, patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells that are available. Uh, we have eight cell lines, 16 whole blood DNA sets, and then um, some saliva samples as well. Um, and these are great. They're, they're, they're readily available for researchers who um, are qualified research. They're very nominal fees, really mostly for shipping. Um, and, and anybody who's interested in, in talking about this, I'm happy to. These are the available IPSC lines. Um, and I believe most of them are missense variants, but there's a few truncating variants as well. Okay. Um, in terms of where, what types of mutations we're talking about or pathogenic variants. So typically they will collect all information. So remember when maybe some of you had a variant of unclear significance and then it became pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Um, we know that these grins are growing and we're learning. So we will enroll you even if it's just a variant and then we're gonna continue to follow you. And, and if it ends up being updated later, great, we'll include that um, in, your, in your information. Um, the majority are um, missense variants as you can see here. So here's the gene, here's a, like a nice little schematic. And each one of these lollipops represents um, a person at a specific location. I like to call them typos, right? So the, the red ones are typos. Um, and then up here is the specific um, locations of each of those variants. I'm not going to go through them. Um, there are a few frame shift nonsense variants um, and some splice site variants and some deletions that are, were not shown here. If you want more information on this, we're happy to share that. In terms of medical data, so here's where we come into the powerful information. Um, you know, we really aim to kind of collect high quality information based on caregiver report. Um, this is a really great slide. It shows that, you know, in the individuals that we have, 72 individuals between one year and 35 years, this is just a snapshot of those individuals. Um, importantly, 66 of those were younger than 18. And so you can see right here, whoopsies, back. Um, right here, this is showing the abundance of people. So you have more people who are younger, less people who are older. This is so important, right? So we know that there's people who are alive who um, have this disorder. What we need to do is keep, keep all you guys involved and keep moving forward together, right? Because we need to understand what's happening over time. This is just a snapshot. The average age of people in that 72 people is eight years old. Um, so as you can see, the majority are younger. So stick with us, all right? Because this is really only gonna help the community understand what happens over time. In terms of developmental and behavioral conditions, as are neurodevelopmental disorders, um, they have language delays, language impairment in the majority. Um, there are uh, about 30% of individuals do present with an autism diagnosis. Um, anxiety and ADHD symptoms are also common as well as OCD. Neurologically, I'm a neurologist, so many children um, get diagnosed with hypotonia or low muscle tone, um, and then we collect information on other different diagnoses that might um, that you might see with your uh, your your loved one. Um, coordination problems for sure, cortical visual impairment as well. Seizures are not big, um, you know, and I think we've we've shown this within the grin 2 b community. It's not a large epilepsy phenotype, but um, there are different types of seizures that are seen in these groups. So 72 individuals provided information about this. 
And in terms of looking at those at 30 people who did provide information a little bit more about their baseline seizure, the, the seizure onset was anywhere from the first month of life to seven years of age. The average age of first seizure in this group was two years of age. Um, and about half of them ended up having to take medication to control their seizures. Um, and about three quarters still do continue to take medication for their seizures. Um, 17%, meaning five of these individuals had a seizure, they actually were able to control them. Um, and, and it did take about four years for that to happen. Um, and it could take a little bit longer. There are vision com common problems that we see across the group, such as strabismus or cross-eyed or lazy eyes. And then there's additional medical issues and you know, neurologic, I think it's lumped often if it's not something else in the body, just blame it on the brain. Um, what we have to do remember though, is that very often your pediatrician just has to remember that you're still a child and you can still have a earache and a strep throat and, and all those other things that other children can have as well, or adults. We do collect information about medication and, and the goal of this is really, you know, on your forums, you're probably talking on Facebook and other social media to really understand what medications might work for you that might not work for somebody else. And, and this can be really helpful. And so, you know, I think the majority of the uh, medications that we're seeing is related to um, sleep and gastrointestinal issues. Um, so this is very, I think, helpful information overall. Um, oops, what I did wanna say, um, there actually is no particular medication that seems to be helpful for seizures. And, and I think we've, we've learned why, right? Because um, some of the variants cause too much activation and some cause too, too little. And so um, overall, there's not really one specific medication that's perfect. The goal of this is to harmonize our data sets and then maybe say, is this medication working better for these functional groups, et cetera. Um, the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale is something that's, um, it's, it's a long kind of tedious questionnaire, but it's very helpful. It's a caregiver report that gives information about the adaptive skills. Now, I'm not going to go too much into this because I think the graphs can get a little bit tricky to understand. I know, it's really busy, but it's actually quite, a, um, it's, it's quite helpful, I think. People understand where their children are, um, and the goal really is to provide information back about well, where, what's gonna happen as people get older. Um, so this is what we call cross-sectional. So if we looked at all the individuals, so here we're looking at 45 individuals with grin 2 b at this point in time. And so each one of these little blue dots is a person with grin 2 b On the bottom is their actual age. So this person is actually 17 years old. These people are actually one or two years old. On the y-axis is kind of their level of functioning. So if I actually did the you know, psychological adaptive testing, where would they kind of lie out? And so you would expect, I think let's use 10 as an example. So at, at 10 years of age, we would kind of expect them to be at, at, at that 10 point, all right? And if we draw a line of all the individuals with, um, with brand 2B, we see that they're, they're behind where they're supposed to be. And we, we know that because that's kind of how we got here. Um, but people do want to know what's going to happen to my child as they get older. Now, this is cross-sectional, meaning I'm just looking at them now. I haven't taken those people and watched them over time. That's the goal, hopefully, of all of these data sets is to follow them over time. Yes. Oh, that's my five-minute mark. I think I have like two more slides, so we're good. Um, so for example, I'll just give some nice little highlights. So this is a child who's four years old, and at, at the four years age, they're about two and a half years of age um, in terms of their level of speech, okay? Um, and this dotted line down here is kind of that at around one year old, we typically expect somebody to have single words. Does that make sense for everybody? We'll kind of go through a few of these. Um, this is looking at personal care skills. So how well do individuals take care of themselves? Same um, situation where the blue dots each represent a person on the bottom is their actual age on the y-axis up here is um, their uh, level of functioning age. So the first dotted line down here around two is a typical milestone that we would see is that somebody can feed themselves not nicely, but they can feed themselves with a fork and a spoon, right? Um, and so, and then at four years of age, we think that that child should be able to kind of dress themselves. Um, so what we're seeing here is that typically around six years old, we're more kind of seeing if we look at the group as a whole, they're able to kind of feed themselves. Um, up here, typically around that 16, 17 year old, um, we're starting to see skills that are higher, such as dressing themselves, okay? This is expressive language development. So this is looking at the speech. We just did that. 
going the wrong direction, personal scale care, and then social development. Okay, so I think this is the last one. And so um, similar trend, and you guys are becoming experts in this, the actual age and their level of functioning. So the bottom dotted line is an example of making eye contact. And then the two-year-old mark is more showing interest in friends. And so for here, um, again, you have a, a lower kind of age. So um, around that six years of age is starting when we're starting to make those eye contact and engage in those social relationships. Um, gross motor skills is a little bit stronger. And so um, the bottom line is when we're walking without help, typically that's around one year old. In the grin to b group, we're seeing that happen more around three. In terms of hopping and jumping, we, we typically see that around three. And, and in this group, we're seeing that more around 11 or 12, okay? So that's just an example of the kind of data that they're collecting and kind of at a cross snapshot. And then hopefully as they're getting older, we're kind of gonna be able to make some more um, real longitudinal um, comparisons between the groups. The CBCL is another checklist that we look at to look at different types of behaviors. And just in summary, for the younger kiddos, so this is 28 individuals who are one and a half to five, really some of the, the noted behavioral concerns or challenges are hyperactive behaviors, chewing on non-food items, we sometimes call that pica, um, desiring frequent attention, attention-seeking behavior, um, and difficulty waiting a turn. Um, and then in the older individuals in the 16 to 18 year old, we're talking more about frequently being distracted, some obsessions, more frequent attention and kind of hyperactive behaviors. And so in summary, and I promise we're done, um, some of the more common issues that we're seeing reported by caregivers are low muscle tone or hypotonia, language delays, eye problems like strabismus and GI issues. And some of the other issues that certainly is being noted in the group is autism, other vision problems, seizures, scoliosis, and attention um, deficit problems such as ADHD. So thank you very much. Again, I want to say clap for you guys because the Green TV leaders did that. And I implore you to keep moving those data sets up. Questions? Question uh, through the app. So either, either someone in the room or someone watching virtually, actually two questions that are similar. So I'm trying to have trouble finding it. But one is, is okay, is Simon's going to expand to GRIA grip and grid patients? And if a GRIA patient has an autumn Autism diagnosis, does that mean they can donate to Spark, but not Simon Searchlight? I will answer number one first. So number one is, um, will they expand to other gene groups? Yeah, so the goal is to expand to as many of the degrees as possible now that we recognize this as a gene group. Um, the way it works logistically, whenever anybody gets involved in human subject research, there is ethics. Um, there's an ethical board. You might have heard the term institutional review board or IRB. For this project, typically we need at least five people to kind of be in a group before we kind of release that information out. So there might be some people, those one or twos, but we can't release that information out yet. Um, obviously, if you have one parent who has, you know, whatever disorder, a disorder X, um, and they say, oh, everybody signed up for Simon Searchlight, you know, I did, and we know there's one person, that's that person. Um, so the goal really is to try to keep it as de-identified as possible. So you, you, let's let's do the, the lemming thing and everybody do it together. Um, and, and the more people you get, the more that data will kind of come back. The second question was about... If someone has a blood, blood to spark. Um, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, I believe if you have the autism diagnosis, you can go in and, and get that. If you already have the, the genetic testing, I'm not sure what the, the, um, whether you would be enrolled or not, but I can find out, okay? And the, the other thing that I've heard from Simon's, I think there's a meeting in about two months where they're considering new genes to add. And so the, the GRIAs and GRICs are on the list. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we've recognized is that we're talking about gene groups. How do we build numbers? We're going to all, all boats rise. So, you know, we're, we, we started with GRIN2B. They did a great job kind of pushing through forward with this collaboration. And I think hopefully the other GRINs can, can jump on board too and um, kind of move forward. And I think if you continue to show the need that we are a large gene group and we, you know, work together, that power will be seen much more. In terms of uh, medical history, do you guys collect CBC urinalysis type of data as well? What was the first? I heard urine. Uh, 
Complete blood cell count? Oh, CBCs. We don't collect the blood counts per se, no. Um, you know, we don't do the blood testing directly itself. We don't do like the urinalysis or anything like that. Um, there are, like I said, like they'll collect the, the biospecimens. It sits in a bank. They're not doing the research on it. They're making that tool available to other people. Um, and I think, you know, people probably could donate information of testing that they've had, but they're not doing the actual testing itself. I think you guys should encourage people to donate those kinds of results because there could be things that match, like uh, a lot of people have in common that could pop up. Like, for example, I thought it was interesting that a lot of people take allergy medicine and green 2 b is very important for a neutrophil function. So perhaps there could be some discrepancies within the CBC that we should be looking for. That's exactly right. I mean, I think the goal of this is to kind of kick baseline information for everybody. And then um, if there's researchers who are particularly interested in neutrophil function, you know, go in there and say, okay, now I want to get all the clinical phenotype data I can there um, and, and really kind of deeply dissect the data that they have there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, Sylvia is my student and um, we have a similar question, which is uh, when patients sign up, um, is there any kind of consent to release for research, um, consent to release medical, de-identified medical information for research purposes? Because we would be very interested if we see something in our animals, is that true in the patients? And, um, you know, we, we have a feeling that people might have submitted their, um, you know, when they go to the hospital, they probably run some of these standard tests. And, um, you know, it, it would be nice if we could mine some of that information Absolutely. without having an extra blood draw for it. A hundred percent. So we can definitely talk a lot offline about the specifics, but this is exactly the goal. The goal of Simons is not to do the research itself. It's to facilitate, to build the toolkit. Okay. So they collect all the information. And then someone once told me it's like, you know, the library, right? So you can, you can borrow that information. You can borrow that information. You can borrow that information. So when somebody consents to being a part of Simon's Searchlight, they are consenting to provide all of their, their data, de-identified to be shared. Um, so that's the exact purpose of the project. Um, and so we can definitely talk offline about seeing what information is being collected from, from your group. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks so much. Enjoy dinner. Wrapping things up, uh, we have a virtual presentation um, from Dr. Alan Bayat on GRIAs. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alan, and I'm a medical doctor from Denmark. Um, I'm here because I want to give you an insight about the kind of research we do uh, in my team, uh, which is actually about all GRIA-related disorders. So the talk today is going to focus on GRIA-3, but I mean, it could also just basically have been any of the other GRIA uh, genes. Um, so we want to help people with GRIA-related uh, disorders to better understand their disease and help them to get a better treatment. So basically, that's what we want to do. Before we go further, I just want to give you a short introduction to this very important and re really cool system in the brain of how cells interact with each other. So here on the picture, we have two brain cells. Um, and the first brain cell in yellow creates a current. So cells talk with each other by creating an electrical current. So the current starts in the cells and then it reaches the end. And then wh th what happens then is that a substance called glidamate is then released. And glidamate is really important. So remember that name. Glidamate is really cool and binds to two receptors on top of cells around the first cell. So these receptors are called the NMDA, uh, which is encoded by the green genes, or the AMPA, the AMPA receptor, encoded by the GRIA genes. And what happens when glidamate binds? Well, then the receptor opens 
an electrical current is then created and that turns on the next cell, which then passes the electrical current and then more glidomase is, re is released and more cells are activated. So this is really an important system in the brain. Now we're zooming into the AMPA receptor. The AMPA receptor is built up by small subunits or building blocks. And these building blocks are created by the GRIA genes. So we have four GRIA genes, GRIA one, two, three, and of course, four. They're all important and all very cool, but GRIA three is very unique because it's X-linked. And what, it, what does that mean? Well. When you talk about X-linked disorders, you commonly think of something where healthy females are carriers of a disease and then pass this on to, for example, boys that get ill. So boys are ill because they only have one X chromosome, while females are carriers because they have two X chromosomes. The question is, why is research in Gria important? I think it's important because we have so limited knowledge. And that's because um, very few patients and very little research has been done uh, in, in uh, human diseases related to GRIA. Uh, so we just need to do better. And how to overcome this? Well, we have envisioned uh, a project where we start collecting a lot of clinical information, preferably as much as possible from patients that have or could have a green related disorder. So all of this information is collected in our registry so we can understand what kind of symptoms you're facing and also how symptoms evolve over time. Then we start studying the mutations and we do this in uh, here in, uh, in the lab. And what we do is we ask three questions. First question is, does the, this human mutation affect the function of the AMPA receptor? And then we study this. We can measure if a mutation is making the AMPA receptor work poorly or differently. Next question is, well, if it's affecting the AMPA receptor, how is, is the effect? Is the AMPA receptor too active, which we call a gain of function, or is it not functioning uh, enough and has a loss effect? This is a loss of function. So we can have either a gain of function or a loss of function mutation. And the third question is, how can we reverse these effects? So if we have a gain of function mutation, can we, for example, use a drug called parampanol, which is a blocker of these AMPA receptors to sort of uh, improve the health uh, and symptoms in GRIA patients? And in the end, all of this is passed on to you or your medical doctors for better counseling and treatment. So let's look a little bit further into what we're doing in the lab. So we work with, uh, with frogs and with egg cells from frog. Egg cells are called uh, oocytes and we uh, harvest these oocytes from, this, uh, from the frogs and we use this to study the human mutations. So you see here, we've harvested these cells from the frog and they look like small tiny balls uh, here uh, under the microscope. Now these uh, cells, actually do not express the AMPA receptor. So we need to make them uh, express this. We do this by injecting them with a small copy of the human uh, gene. Let's say we want to study GRIA3. So we inject them with a copy of GRIA3. And this can be a normal healthy copy of GRIA3, uh, or it can be a copy of GRIA3 that has a human mutation that we want to study. So in the figure, you can see I'm injecting it with a copy of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of GRIA, uh, and it has a human mutation. Then I'll let the oocytes rest for a few days in the fridge. And what happens is that the oocyte will start building these um, uh, building blocks or GRIA, because now it sort of has the recipe for GRIA. It starts building these uh, subunits and making ample receptors on top of the cell. 
After three or four days, we take out the oocytes, put it here in a barrel, we stick two uh, needles within it, and then we pour different uh, uh, chemicals on top of it, and we can then measure how the alpha receptor is functioning, which is pretty cool and fairly easy to do. Every time you do research, you need like you need a control. So here we've taken an oocyte, we've injected it with the normal functioning copy of let's say GRIA3. So the alpha receptors here in the cell are working just as they should in healthy patients. And what happens is that we uh, add increasing concentration of glidamate. Uh, as you see, the numbers are increasing, meaning that you're pouring more and more glidamate on top of the oocyte. And as you remember, glidamate activates the receptor, it opens it, and you see that the more glidamate you pour, the bigger current you get. So this is like the control, and we compare it uh, with other results from the human mutation, and I'll show you this later. So let's get back to the patients. So we have uh, at least 25 patients with GRIA-related disorders, 14 males and 11 females. And this is mind-blowing because now we're showing that a lot of females can actually be affected. That's really cool, I think. And of course, also important for counseling. The majority of, of, of patients are, of course, children. Uh, so the average age is about 10. Some are much younger and some are older. As you see, there's some adults uh, in their 30s. All have global developmental problems, but it ranges from mild to severe. So let's have a look at the mild spectrum. I've listed some of the symptoms here. Often the early milestones are normal, but then around infancy, uh, you start seeing problems with development. Often patients learn to walk, but the gait is unsteady. Some have epilepsy, most do not, but in terms of treatment of seizures, it's quite easy and patients do become seizure free. This is the worst part of the spectrum where patients unfortunately are affected immediately at birth. They're very stiff and cannot relax their muscles. So that really hinders development. They cannot feed and are depending on a feeding tube. They have no unlimited eye contact. They don't really develop and have uh, epilepsy starting very, very early in life and it's really difficult to treat it. Here I'm showing you two girls that have mutations in GRIA causing the AMPA receptor to be very overactive. So two um, gain of function mutations. The small baby has a strong, strong gain of function and the bigger girl, the infant has a less strong. And what you can appreciate is how stiff they are. You can see that the baby has a feeding tube You can see how stiff she is. She's unable to relax her arms and her legs. Noise and even touch makes her twitch. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. So again, you can see how incredibly stiff she is. This young girl over here, also has stiffness. She's a bit older, but you can see her eye contract is 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 actually quite good. And she's trying to interact, but she also is very stiff in the arms, legs, neck, and the trunk. Patients often have behavioral or psychiatric problems in terms of behavior. It can be that they can be very sensitive, very anxious, but often those with loss of function mutations are aggressive and have a short temper. But across all patients with gain of function or loss of function mutations, being anxious, being sensitive, being hyperactive, having too little attention span or having problems with social interaction uh, is seen and is quite common. So as you remember, we had 25 patients. 
in these 25 patients, we found 17 unique mutations. So I'm showing you three examples of results from three different people. So in the box, that was the control. Above here, you have one patient that had a mutation on position 609. This mutation is not really causing any change in the current. And of course, we did a lot of other tests. And in the end, we went back to the clinician and to the family and said, we do not think this mutation is the cause of illness. And we suggest maybe looking for another cause by going back to the, geno to the genetics again. In the middle, we have a patient with a gain of function mutation on position 654, where you see that the, the currents are much stronger. While down here, this is a loss of function mutation on position 776, where there is hardly any current at all. So examples of a gain of function or a loss of function mutation. Now, the cool stuff is that we can merge these lab results with the clinical data where we have. We're starting to see patterns, patterns of symptoms. So let's say, for example, in both gain or loss of function mutations, patients do have epilepsy, but we see that if you have a gain of function mutation, you do have a tendency to start seizuring much, much earlier in life, often around the first months of life. Whereas if you have loss of function mutation, the seizures often start after your first birthday. We also see that the stiffness and the startling and hyperexplexia, as you saw in the baby, is something that we almost only see in gain of function mutations. So that's like what we call clinical biomarkers of whether something is a gain of function or a loss of function mutation. The take home message is that both males and females can be affected. Males are often uh, carrying mutations that they have from their mothers, and they often have mutations that are loss of function, while females often have, uh, are the first people in the family to have the mutation. The mutation is not inherited from the parents, and in females often is caused by gain of function. And then I just very briefly want to thank Turgrin and families and people around the world that have helped us with our research and I just have one final comment, which is that we would really like to get in contact with families uh, and patients that have the symptoms that you saw on the video. So this stiffness and involuntary movements, we really want to study that further. So if you are a parent uh, of uh, or a caregiver of a patient that had these symptoms, then please reach out to me. We'd like to study some videos and understand what kind of symptoms patients are having and how they develop uh, over time. We really think that's crucial and important uh, aspect as well. And with that, I would like to thank you, you all, thank you, the audience, and wish you a very, very nice conference. Thank you. So thank you to uh, Dr. Benke, Dr. Bain, and Dr. Byatt, oh, all bees, um, for your presentations today. And um, so we're at the end. I think they're gonna put up a couple final slides. Did you guys have a good time? Did you learn stuff? Was this worthwhile? Good. Oh, it's okay, because the other session's coming in now. We're just waiting for the slides. You guys are gonna have high expectations now, but these are not great slides. I'm just telling you like, <laughs> what, we're, what we're waiting for maybe isn't worth it. Okay, okay. You, you, so um, this, it's okay, we'll go without the slides. Um, I did wanna put up um, the, the sponsor slide again, which um, we have here. So just wanna thank all of the sponsors 
um, Grin Therapeutics, Simon Searchlight, Safety Sleeper, Numora, Cure Epilepsy, Sage Therapeutics, Ovid Therapeutics, Homology Medicines, Grin 2B Foundation, Children's Hospital Colorado, as well as our four family sponsors, Carter Williams, Metric Family, Team Bradman, and Downing Family. Was there one before that? Okay, yeah. So if you would like, if you are going to the Science Center tomorrow, just a reminder, is this time good? Meeting, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Lauren and uh, Casey uh, will meet you in the ho hotel lobby tomorrow at 8.45, um, or you can make your way over later. Um, so after that, slide with the sponsors. Okay, yeah, next one, please. Okay, so want to um, just make sure we thank some people who have helped make this weekend possible. So first I wanna thank the, um, the whole Kiergren team. So uh, Denise Ranner, Megan Collins, Lauren Williams, Brittany Brown, and the, the rest of the, the board of directors, um, the three who are here today and the others who couldn't make it. Thank you so much. Um, from the MedLogix team, Jennifer Hernandez, who's here, and Lindsay Luce and Sue Sessa, who, um, Weren't, aren't here today, but um, have just been great in helping us put together this amazing conference. Um, thank you to all of you who, who spoke. Um, we had a lot of, of great, great presentations. Um, thank you to the AV team. Thank you to the hotel staff. So let's give, give uh, them a round of applause. Finally, I just want to call up two people in particular. So if Lauren and Megan could come up for a moment. So um, as many of you know, we had our awards dinner last night and um, two of the people who got the most nominations were Megan and <laughs> Lauren. Um, but the selection committee decided that it wasn't, we didn't feel it was appropriate to be giving awards within Cure Grin while people are, are employees of Cure Grin. So they have to wait. I know that they'll get nominations when they're not here anymore, but um, it, you know, it's clear from the nominations and what you guys wrote about Megan and Lauren, how much the community really appreciates the work that you guys do. So I wanna thank you and I'm sure everybody here wants to thank you. Thank you.